So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work we are doing combining molecular dynamic simulations and single molecule experiments. Uh, this work started uh, with Professor Klaus Schulten and I'll continue with Professor uh, Zan Schulten uh, in combination with these uh, great collaborators that we have in Germany and Switzerland now that Michael moved to Switzerland, but with Professor Hermann Gaub in Munich and Michael Nash in Basel. So what they are doing is, uh, the kind of experiments they do is a single molecule force spectroscopy uh, where they use atomic force microscope to pull proteins. So like they, they try to rupture protein complexes, they try to unfold proteins, and they use these cantilevers, uh, there's no point, so they use these cantilevers here, uh, and they, 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 they can go down in the sample and, re and pull it up and remove, like say, a complex, a, break a complex apart or unfold a protein while they do that. We try to do the same thing using steer molecular dynamics in the simulations, and we have been very successful in combining the two techniques uh, in the last few years. So both techniques are gonna give us a force extension curve, and this force extension curve we can use to analyze like, the properties of the system, but also the molecular dynamics give us extreme like resolution because we know what every atom is during the whole simulation, during the whole process, so we can analyze that too. I'm gonna talk to you about two systems very quickly, one of them is a cellulosome, the other one is a desin. They are both bacterial proteins that are outside of the, the bacteria membrane, and they, their similarities, the only thing is they are very strong, and that's the reason why we started to study them. So cellulosomes, they are used for some bacteria to digest from plant fiber, and these organisms very commonly live in very turbulent environments, so you can imagine that the the proteins that form the cellulosomes, they must interact with a very strong force. What we studied in the past was this uh, part of the cellulosome, in this case here, uh, here. <laughs> uh, in this case here, we have this uh, cellulosome from Rubinococcus flavifensis that it's very large and it's formed by this cohesin docker interactions and you have many enzymes, this red part, and the one in the bottom that we studied uses to hold the, the whole bacteria to its substrate, like to its plant fiber. And you can imagine like these interactions are now under constant uh, uh, shear tension because the, 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 the fluid like it's moving around and it's trying to rip this thing apart. So when we did this study, we saw that the system was the, the most, uh, like the strongest system ever found at the time and was like about three times stronger than any other system that anyone knew. But at the same time, it had a very common place uh, KD, so you could form and unform without force very easily, but when you apply force, they get very strong and you could not break it apart. So we were able to use this combination of techniques to show how this happens, like how these interactions uh, are, how these interactions are, are making this system have this different property, and also how force propagates through this system. But then we started to think about what comes really like the talk today is, can we start using the simulations to engineer these proteins? Can we change these proteins and understand better how this system works? And then we start looking at another cellulosome from uh, Acetivibrius cellulolyticus that has this very long uh, scaffolding, not actually not that much longer than all the, all the other ones, but it has these seven cohesins and we knew that each one, they were very similar, but there was a, a paper published in 2009 saying that they should be different in force resilience. So like, okay, let's try that with a new technique that uh, Hermann Gaub de uh, group developed that you could do in parallel, many of them, so you could really compare the force strength that they could handle. And what we saw is, even though they're very similar in sequence, some of them are much weaker than the others. So you can see here the, at the bottom, that's the force that they can handle, like, like the first one, the cohesion one at the top, can handle over a little bit over 100 piconewtons of force, which is not remarkable. And some of them can reach to almost 600 in force, which is quite remarkable, actually. So if you look at the sequence, they are pretty much the same. How come they have such a difference in force they can, they can hold? So none of the structures were available. We used some uh, uh, modeling techniques to get the structures of this system. And what we got at the end was a very good agreement with the simulation, with the experiments. And we saw like uh, both experiment and simulations gave us about the same behavior, 
but the simulations could also give us where we could, where were the differences during this process like of, of rupture in this system. And what we found was we could suggest a mutation, and we actually suggest four mutations that are here at the bottom, and basically one simple mutation, like one alanine to a glycine should increase force, two other mutations were not making anything, a triple mutant should be even stronger. And when we did the experiment, we actually, here are the three cohesins, like just cohesin one, two, three, and then we did the modifications here that with the mutants we did, we could, with only one mutation, increase the force of this, to, to, to rupture this cohesin from about 100 piconewtons to about 300 piconewtons or 400 piconewtons. So we increased 2.6 folds, the, the force necessary to break this system with only one mutation. And more impressive, this mutation was just changing a CH3 to a proton. So by, by changing one CH3 to a proton, we were able to increase the stability of the system by 2.6 fold. Um, that was done in this combination of SMD, like tr checking what was happening with the system, seeing that the stability was being affected by this extra uh, CH3 in that region. Then we started to think, okay, but there are other systems that take advantage of uh, these mechanically strong interactions. And we started to look more medical systems. And then uh, what we found very interesting is that a lot of people are studying uh, adhesins as one of new roads, routes to, uh, uh, to kill a bacteria that is uh, this methicillin resistant bacteria. So this bacteria that we cannot kill with antibiotics today. And what, what happened is, instead of killing the bacteria, you could kill this adhesin, and by doing that, the bacteria cannot form uh, these biofilms that they form, and our organism could kill these bacteria for us. So instead of creating antibiotic, we're creating another class of drugs that they call antimicrobial therapy that doesn't kill the bacteria, but that let our system kill the bacteria more easily. And basically these bacteria are very nasty to us, especially when we have like some kind of implants or like a pacemaker or something, because they can easily grow over the surface of the extracellular matrix that is formed over these implants pretty quickly when we, we have a surgery. Um, how they do that is they use these uh, adhesins to, to target some peptides, some, some proteins actually, but like the tail of these proteins, uh, and they hold to that very strongly and so that they cannot be removed by the blood flow in the system. So it's actually a, lo a lot of force that is applied over them. And this uh, different adhesins can target different proteins. So they, they look pretty much the same, but they, some of them uh, uh, target fibronectin, some of them target keratin, some of them target collagen. And the one that we studied first was the one targeting uh, fibrinogen. And this is very important because it's part of the process that we have the blood clots, basically how when you have stopped bleeding like in an accident, this, is, uh, uh, b this bacteria can take advantage of that, like this uh, bleeding mechanism. Uh, so what we did was to do the same kind of experiment that I mentioned before. They did the experiment, I did the simulations. So I started the simulations. Lucas, uh, our PhD student in, in Germany, started the, the experiments, and then he called me one day and like, oh, did you get the, uh, uh, the results already, Rafael? And like, yeah, I'm having some weird results. It's pretty strong, you know, like I'm seeing something here that there must be something wrong with my simulations. And then he sent me a video of his AFM. Usually when you break a protein, you have like a click that they can hear really like in the, because of the way that the feedback loop works in the AFM. And the click was like, was very strong, like much stronger than any other thing that they seen before. And first thing he thought, was well, he broke the microscope. <laughs> and, and, and then we started looking at it and that was crazy strong, it was stronger than many covalent bonds, but there's no covalent bond there. And okay, there must be something wrong. And that's where Blue Waters came up. We started to do a lot of replicas, a lot of tests. And here I'm showing a plot to you that this right-hand side of the plot, these are all computational data. The left-hand side is the experimental data. The experimental data is excluded from the fit. All the simulation data fits perfectly over the experimental data. So like we could reproduce exactly what they were doing. So now that we are 100% sure we are doing it well, we can go ahead and try 
understand what is happening with the system. So what is the mechanism behind? So first thing, when this, this st structure was published, they say there is this bougie plug, this book residues that are the two phenylalanines that are kind of working like blocking this uh, complex to, to separate. They didn't know that it was that strong. Nobody knew that it was that strong, but they were like, oh, these are the guys that are making this thing strong. So the obvious thing we try, let's mutate them. When we did that, both in vitro and in silico, we saw, okay, force is not really going down. It's still very strong, still in the nanonewton regime. Still an order of magnitude stronger than any other thing that we know. Let's try again. Now, just in silico, because you could not do that in the experiment, I start cutting every amino acid one at a time, seeing what was the minimum size we could work with. And I have to reduce, like you see, like even cutting half of the system, I still had nanonewton regime, like 60% of that force is still nanonewton, so it's still very strong. And we started to look like what is happening in the system. And then we noticed that most of the time, we could see hydrogen bond forming only between backbone and backbone. So basically between the backbone of this peptide and the backbone of the protein, of the adhesin. And then we started thinking like, okay, can we mutate the whole peptide and see if it's too strong? Of course, you cannot do that in the experiment because it would not bind, but in the computer we can. And what I did was to change the whole peptide to gly glycine. And even when I did that, the system seems strong. And then we start looking at the hydrogen bonds, like distribution, like in different mutants that we try, like cutting these phenylalanines and also cutting the glycine, and they all have very strong, very prevalent hydrogen bonds in the backbone. So then what we did was, so this is the, let's say the most impressive one in my opinion. The, in green you see the results from the native system, the wild type system. And then in blue is the all glycine peptide, still nanonewton regime is of course it's weaker but it's still nanonewton regime and then I start to play God and I okay let's kill Coulomb we don't have Coulomb anymore and what happened with the original peptide not with the alglycine one is that the contribution basically is the sum of some uh, Coulomb contribution from the side so sorry from some van der Waals contribution from the side chains and, and the basically the side chains because of their bulky and the most part comes from the hydrogen bonds in the backbone, actually. So we could still keep uh, nanonewton forces only with the backbone. So then comes to the last part. What we did was, okay, so if, if it's, this thing does not depend on the sequence, there must be other adhesins that are having the same kind of behavior. And we found six other adhesins that the structure was available. We try all of them. Uh, particularly experimentally because of computer time, you know, like using all this computer time to explain the system. And what we saw at the end was all of them were very strong, even though they're like, and all of them were very, very similar binding different peptides. And one of them was a modified uh, protein that was binding a peptide that was only glycine, glycine, serine, glycine, glycine, serine, glycine, glycine, serine. So basically a peptide without side chains. And it was still in the nanonewton regime. So all these systems are very strong, and they are one of the reasons why this bacteria is so hard to kill, because they, when they bind to your body, they, they cannot be removed. And they start to form these biofilms, and we cannot attack them with normal antibiotics anymore. Uh, so with that, I have to thank everybody that helped in this work and some other work that I kind of mentioned quickly here, and thank you all for your attention.